How did you guys meet, first of all? And <laughs> um, you wouldn't normally work together, so can you talk a little bit about how you met and how you came to work together? I have a couple stories on this one, um, which Phil might not recall because, as cl cl uh, and I wouldn't expect him to on this one, um, because at the time before, maybe I started, I don't remember, the start of my, my career at Kresge was a little hazy and largely is due in fact I was playing in a band um, and still thinking like being paid in beer was okay and I had this other job, I'm like, well, I'll do that, but, um, uh, and I remember, I think I met Phil first, I hear about this guy who's opening a barbecue <laughs> restaurant, I was playing, my band was playing the Woodridge Summerfest and Phil, I think, had a barbecue cart. Um, I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Let's see where that goes. Um, and I think, you know, there's been, there, that, that's one. Like, there was just kind of these, for me anyway, there was this period of time, and I think you would, you would agree with it, Phil, that you were kind of everywhere, whether you wanted to be or not, just in terms of how people were talking about slows or, uh, um, or, or what's just happening, like, with, 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 uh, with uh, Michigan Avenue where slows is. Um, and, you know, then one of my, my, my future wife, her best friend, was a bartender at slows. Um, Slows was a place you would go to. I mean, I spent a lot of time on Michigan Avenue, so it was not hard to kind of run into Phil. So I can't think of the formal moment, um, but I guess I would say, you know, the, the, in philanthropy we have, we have so many different things to, to kind of arc towards. Um, and I, I'd be curious about Phil's story, because I, I have no idea when like, we actually formally may have met. I mean, um, if we did, because uh, it's kind of, for me, it's been this weird experience of just mm -hmm. crossing paths. Um, you have a board of directors to report to. You have some things that you have committed yourself to organizationally, and yet you as a person have some, some and it's a great spot to be, you have some personal belief and personal stake, especially if you care about the work that you're doing. And I always wanted to work on Detroit. And so for me, it was always people like Phil and others that I've continued to try to build my career around at Kresge of how we figure out ways to support them. And it's ta it takes a long time to, to do that. It takes political capital internally. Um, but, you know, artist fellows, uh, uh, they have a lot of community-based projects. They're not, it's not about that program or our artist fellowship program. It's not art for art's sake. It's, it, there's a certain layer about artistic excellence is really important across any number of disciplines. But also we want to understand how the community work, uh, uh, what the role is in community. And they can, the artist can self-define that. I think self-definition is actually really important in some of this work. But so many of them have community-oriented projects. A fellowship only gets some folks so far. But what are the other tools and resources you can start bringing, bringing to them? And philanthropy is organized many, many times over in a way, especially an old institution like ours, to deploy grants to certain types of organizations who meet certain thresholds who your board is comfortable with. So the notion you could work with a group with that, without an audit or maybe without a certain budgetary requirement or staffing level, um, we have made, I think, in our Detroit program that commitment that this is where we... We still have those commitments, but we also need to be at this other scale if we're going to really be successful. So for me, like the notion of working with folks like Phil is, is, has been pretty much where I've always wanted to be working, and thankfully, we've had enough supporters internally to kind of get at that. I think, Claire, you know, you, uh, your work, Brian's work in articulating that in Model D does, you know, Model D UIX is often help that. Sorry, Phil. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, so I've seen George at a, a million things, so it's hard to remember what the first event was, you know, whether it was, you know, a social event, having mm -hmm. fun, or a serious sit-down community conversation. There's just been so many. Um, and, but I think what's more important is kind of the relationship that we've had, um, because I'm, I sit on a lot of boards of nonprofits, I've, um, and so I, I try to work towards getting funding for our own work and others' work. And, um, I think what's, what's been really great is that we didn't get funded for such a long time, and, and we really didn't need the money because we would have wasted the money. Um, and so this relationship with Kresge uh, is, has been really, it's been wonderful because it started off really small and now it's kind of medium size. And, and I think we would need, you know, we, we've received really for the first few years like a, a $10,000 grant here or, or something like, uh, along, the, along that size from multiple sources, and um, you know, we did some interesting things with that. Those aren't huge grants, and this is uh, the largest grant, the KIPP D grant is the largest grant we've ever received. My students are, uh, received $150,000, and the Knight Foundation actually funded another group uh, with 150, so they're doing a $300,000 project. And I think it's, it's part of our evolution that hopefully we can, we can continue to do things to, to match that scale. Um, and, and use that money as efficiently as we, 
it's strange. We used to do so much with $20, but if you would have given us $20,000, we would have screwed it all up. Can you tell us a little bit about the process then of, so you come up with an idea or you find a need, you're developing Pony Ride. Like, can you be really specific about a situation where you're like, oh, we could use some grant dollars for this and how that well, started, or was it the other way around? It was just so organic that, you know, we opened up our doors. People started bringing mattresses in and throwing them in old offices and living there. And these are total strangers. I, I, I was doing some work for the Knight Foundation down in Miami, and I might drive in. It was the start of uh, blackmail engagement, Be Me. And so I was going down to advise the launch of that, and I got a phone call in the, in the, um, in the taxi, and I answered it for some reason, um, a Tennessee number, and it was Brian Baker, this amazing um, printer that I had never met in my life, but I could literally hear him smiling. And I'm living in this building, and so I'm just like to this total stranger from Tennessee, yeah, sure, move on in. I'll see you Memorial Day weekend. I'll help you unload your U-Haul, which never, never help anyone unload any typeset stuff. That stuff is so heavy. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, it was, it, we had no idea what we were doing. And by asking the community to come in and help us name the place, help us define our mission, help us, you know, determine, we, we thought, we were pretty arrogant, I think, at the start. We thought we were going to be kind of like post Cranbrook, Cranbrook. You know, we were all these like fancy people come in, and it will be a great resource because after you graduate, you know, from university, you don't have access to all those awesome tools anymore. So we we wanted to create this kind of community that you could you could play around, tinker, and experiment with. But it became so much more because that's what the community wanted and demanded. And so, really, it took that change and evolution to us to figure out how to spend that money effectively and where we, where we could make an impact um, well, positive with our community instead of like at our community, I guess. Yes. And you're inventing something that there's not necessarily a clear market for, right? So you have to develop that as you go. Yeah. And then how did you, how did you first engage then with Pony Ride? We heard about Phil, but... <laughs> Uh, what was the first time you worked to actually worked together? Well, it wasn't Exchange fluids or dollars or anything? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't through Phil, and it, uh, but it was through a, a partner who works on the Lawrence Tech Project, an artist, uh, Steve Coy, and his partner, Dorota, uh, who operate under the, the, uh, something called the Hygienic Dress League. Uh, and Steve, um, and certainly Dorota too, but Steve is a very, um, he's a compelling individual. He's very personable. He's nice. Uh, and he said, hey, we're doing this thing. Do you want to, he just kind of caught me and, and a colleague. And um, I don't know when or where or why or how he did, but we, he's like, just come check, check out Pointer. And I think this is where Steve gave myself and Benji Kennedy, uh, who Brian referenced earlier, my, my colleague and uh, as of recently my, my boss, um, to, to bring Benji and I through Pony Ride Space in its very raw form. And I think both Benji and I initially were just like, you know, I think in our heads, it was like, Steve had a project, and I think it's coming actually to some degree fruition through this project. It was the container project that he, was, he continued to kind of think about. And that took at least enough three or four years, I think, and fundamentally, in terms of like the genesis of that conversation. Um, but seeing the pony ride space and kind of getting a sense for like what was gonna go on there, and uh, it was really interesting. And I think we have continued, continued to go back to that space periodically, whether we're bringing folks through in the community. Uh, we, we do a lot of tours. Um, at Kresge, whether it's other national philanthropic organizations or um, trustees, potential trustees, things like that. Like, and we usually stop at Pony Ride. Actually, uh, we were, <laughs> uh, there's always something new there. There's always something new there. I remember when I took one of our potential trustees, he did not end up joining our board, uh, through there, and they kind of put me and another colleague, like, well, you, you can give them the tool, cool tour, right? Um, okay. Um, and then this is where I met the guys who, who run Be Beard Balm. I had no idea that there is these these three or four guys with huge beards under the stairs making beard balm in Pony Ride. And yet, there they were all of a sudden. And we opened this door, and he, they just basically said, would you like some beard balm? And I just used it this morning. It's, it's just still, Pony Ride is now just a part of the fabric. Um, it's, it's not anything you have to really stretch your mind around. I think initially, it was just interesting to see how it developed. Um, so no, no fluids, but beard balm. <laughs> um. I want to open it up, but I just want to ask, I guess, one more question. Um, 
let's go, let's go to the tension. Sometimes there's a little frustration, right, with uh, from both sides. Like if you're an artist or an activist and you're hoping to get support for what you're doing, but maybe you don't come from like a business mindset. You're trying to you know pitch the value or the uh, potential impact of your idea. And, and maybe your foundation, you have to make the business case to your board or to your boss about why this is worth investing in. Um, can you talk from both of your perspectives a little bit about maybe a frustration of working with the other and uh, what you'd like the other to understand about you and your work? Do you start or you want? You go ahead. <laughs> I think it's, it's really hard to complain about this, um, and it's pretty much across the board, but the, the reporting can be difficult, um, and that, not just the technical mm -hmm. issues, it's just the constant reporting. I, I understand why it's there, um, but I think... You mean like uh, for grants? For gra you, gra yeah. yeah, and I think that um, I understand that there needs, and, and, and it helps organizations oftentimes to think about the metrics of their impact. and all. So, I mean, there is definitely positive impact that comes out of it. Uh, I just feel that it, it can be heavy at times. And, and I think also the work that often is getting done is um, urgent. And so when, when folks are doing this, this work, this urgent work, they're oftentimes not set up to pause and to do the reporting. And it takes, it, for me, it takes a lot of time. Um, and it takes a lot of, I guess, mental capacity that, um, our organization doesn't have, and I see that a lot of organizations don't have. Um, we're, we're definitely a very do-based organization, yeah, hands dirty, and uh, so our admin is more likely to grab a jackhammer than they are a pen. So, uh, so that, can be, that can be difficult. I think that's a reality for a lot of folks as well. So trying to figure out how you can still glean those, those metrics that are so necessary to understand how you can improve, but without where, you know, being overbearing and, and weighing you down in paperwork. Mm -hmm. I've often wished that I, a grant came with a, an evaluator. <laughs> like, can you just or, or it just came with more money. But a body, yeah, to, to pay for evaluator. an evaluator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the one piece, I mean, there's so much good work happening in Detroit, and I think um, it's really, the, the challenge I have uh, is not with people you know, the frustrations that do exist, and you try to make things as easy as possible at every time, kind of like it's, it's an iterative process. No matter what correction you make, you find some other new way it doesn't work. Um, and so that's just kind of like the forever work, I feel, um, and we have to continue to strive to be better. I think as we've uh, increasingly worked with smaller organizations, like uh, the, there's four staff members who spend their time on this KIPD initiative, and the reason there's four, it's not full time, it's like we spend a lot of time with it, uh, and there's a lot of organizations who are in need of additional capacity and, and support. And we actually take much more of a hands-on role. I, can, I certainly can say I spend a lot more time with, with grants under $20,000 than I do with $2 million grants. Because you, you put the resources out there for a large organization, they're gonna run with it, they have the systems in place, you don't need to, and we're, we're institutionally set up to do that. So working at a, um, a neighborhood-based level is more initially time-consuming, but it's the place where I think we find the most excitement. Um, the, because we work citywide, and as much as we work national, we have this interesting perch. We work with other foundations, we talk to them, and so we kind of see and hear about different projects happening all across the city. Um, and I think having worked with a lot of organizations, there's also this tendency to, well, everyone should feel really good about the work that they do. But it is still nonetheless, despite the fact that there's a lot of philanthropy in Detroit, it's still a very resource scarce environment. Um, those dollars stretch as best as they can, but they do not go far enough. And I think it's really hard to articulate why we make some of the decisions that we make. Um, it's hard to articulate that um, for someone who's so passionate about their work and you don't want to let them down, you want to encourage as best as possible why you're concentrating in some other space, why that decision has already been made. And it's, I think that's a really difficult conversation on, on both sides of it, because you, whether it's a personal or professional, like you see a connection, you might not be able to deliver on that for some time, and it might be an urgent issue. Um, it's, it's just a balancing act and requires, I think, a level of trust and openness, also openness to critique. Um, that is perfectly, I, I think on both sides, the, the critique. I think um, um, that's one where, space where I love to see a greater ability on both sides to figure out a productive way 
to go through the challenges and not necessarily hone in on a defensive posturing, I guess you could say, uh, which can, can happen. Um, it's, it's a tough environment to do work, and I think everyone just wants to see people succeed, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. Um, okay, so we didn't have a lot of time for audience questions, but um, any questions in the room? Yeah, a lot. Shoot, timing. Okay, sorry I have so much space, but we have so many other sessions, so we'll open it up more for the next ones. Um, yes, you. And I might repeat into the mic after you. Could you stand up and ask? Yeah. Okay, this is way too general for my brain. I need more specifics. I need to understand when you said the reporting is difficult, what do you mean? Um, you talk about a little bit about the process. What do you mean? Um, why did you pick the people you did pick? I, I need mm -hmm. to hear more detail, examples, things like Those that. Those are all good questions. Okay, that's great, thank you. Why don't we start with just the first one? We are time limited, so we have to be a little careful of that, but let's see if we can get some more specifics. Um, reporting, I think I, I'm referring to the reporting afterwards um, and during. For receiving you, you a receive grant. receive a grant, there's a lot of report outs to Foundation. do. Oh, not just, yeah, I mean, this is definitely all across the board, during um, and after and um, even before just the grant application process. You know, oftentimes I, I feel that organizations become good grant writers instead of being good at what they're, the work that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and I see that consistently. Um, and they're great at getting grants and then the, the, the output is, you know, not so great. Uh, and, and so that, that, that is, that is a, it's a tricky predicament to be in because <laughs> I wouldn't fund some of the stuff I, I put out there. <laughs> the work is great afterwards, but my grants, I'm, I'm just not a good writer. So I get it why, you know, these things haven't gone through all the time, but I know, you know, and this, I think this is why Brian is partially, you know, interested in this conversation and many others are, is that sometimes there has to be a relationship. George, George and I have built a relationship over years. Kresge and I have built a relationship over years where they can, they can understand my bad writing now. They know what it means. It's, it's a different language I speak in. Yeah, um, so in terms of the, just this particular initiative and why we funded this project, uh, we saw a need to address small scale uh, issues, whether it's around vacant land, underutilized space, vacant buildings, blighted conditions, social conditions, whatever they might be. We let it, we, we put it, we drafted uh, some language around with some advisement uh, from community members as to how might we best do that. We created an application, we created a program to say, uh, we, we generated a commitment to say, we're gonna put $5 million against this for three years for small scale transformations. We opened that up to the community to apply to us. They did, we had, in, in Phil's particular round for Pony Ride, we received 100 applications. Uh, we whittled that down to 20 projects that we would support. Um, these projects spoke to, and the things we funded, there's a couple considerations. We wanted to see projects that happen in every council district across the city so there was one geographic layer. But more, more importantly than that, did the project uh, incorporate inclusive practices? So what we mean by that, how did you engage the community beforehand? How do you know the community needs this? How do you know the community wants this? How do you know your community will participate in this? Did you involve them in the design of that initiative? Are they gonna be involved in the implementation of that initiative? And where do you see that work going over a period of time? I think those are four key deliverables that we wanted to understand. Um, how it supported, broadly speaking, low-income individuals in, in the neighborhood. Some things might have just been about improving the quality of place, others were developing a skill set. In this case, I think there's, there's kind of a both um, for, for uh, de uh, Detroiters. Um, a third piece was, could it be completed in 12 to 18 months? So do you have your permits in a row? Like, do you know what you're going to do and how you're going to deliver this, and can you give us a timeline? And so we took that back to a committee where we had external advisors and as much as our program staff, and we said, these are the 20 projects we're gonna support. Um, from there, we, we write a grant agreement, Phil signs it, and we ask him to tell us how we did, you know, periodically, uh, and try not to make it onerous. I think in, in this particular case, um, there were some, some changes in the project, which can happen, and so we just wanted to kind of understand that as we go through it, because we're yeah. trying to sell, the, we have to continuously sell this back up, right? So if we're gonna keep doing this work, we have to make sure that our trustees are aware of it, why we're doing it, and what we're learning from it. Our 
external colleagues, our foundation peers, like we really try our best to understand why we're investing in this, because if people doubt it or are skeptical of it, or if it just doesn't feel like it's working, I can guarantee you that the funding stops. Yeah, and this, I don't want that. This specific grant is our, our largest by far, and it's actually probably the least amount of reporting that we've done to this point. So that I think that's more I'm talking about when you've just got a $10,000 yeah. grant that the amount of reporting out that we've had to do, it's been, yeah. been tough at times. I don't know if that helped, but hopefully. Yep, yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so about reaching the community, that was my question. <clears throat> How did you talk to people on that street in that neighborhood? How did you engage with them and get them involved? Did everyone hear that question? So the question is, how did they pony ride that project? Yeah, uh, engage with the community, get the community involved. I've lived in that neighborhood for 14 years, so that's helped. I've owned a business and employed people in the community for that long, and so that's helped a lot. But even then, it it took a lot of intentionality. When we first opened, for example, in, in terms of diversity, we we hit all of the marks except racial diversity, and so it took a lot of openness, dialogue, um, and re outreach to be able to improve those numbers. And so while I think um, you know our our, our age diversity is all over the map, um, so that, that's wonderful. Um, I know um, our, I think we're 60% female-owned businesses, and we're up to 45% um, uh, people of color-owned businesses, which isn't great, but it's double what the uh, city of Detroit is as a whole, so that's good, and it's also, uh, it's been an improvement in something we, in our intake committee, we specifically have addressed. We give points to, um, you know, when we do our intake, because we have a waiting list of 100, we give points now, you know, to folks that have a social mission. We have um, give points of uh, businesses that are started by women. We have give point to uh, of your business is owned by people of color. Um, there's all sorts of ways to get in, and uh, that is just to meet our mission. We have to we have to be very honest and and intentional about that process. Well, and something also that Phil can't say about himself, but he's a very like open person. So um, through his story, you know, he's volunteered for many other people and other, he's a yes person, he usually says yes, so if someone comes to him for help, he shares his stuff. So I think that's kind of embedded, talking about talent and leadership, you know, it's, it's embedded in the person that that's their mindset and their way they approach their community. I think um, that helps make a project successful without them even realizing that's part of who they are. Thank you. Speak <laughs> Um, yeah, there was one more question, and then I think we have to move along because hey, we're over time. Uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of slow. Oh, oh, yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, I spent a number of years in Detroit. My question is more so for George versus uh, the other gentleman out there. One of the things that I see, and I lived up during that same, up in Detroit, working in community development during that same period where a lot of the model E and other initiatives were happening in our community, and I see a lot of parallels in terms of what is happening now in the community here uh, when it comes to some of the development downtown uh, and, and to a certain extent some of the questions about where does that investment stop. Uh, certainly up there, uh, there's still this issue of the city constricting, a lot of open space, and the feeling I know a few years ago was that it was a lot of investment downtown but not necessarily getting into the neighborhoods where a lot of the people that needed a lot of resources and funding uh, really were, and to a certain extent, we're starting to see some of that here. What would you suggest to foundations and other funders in this area, uh, how to address that? Because there was a period of, you know, at least three or four years ago, where there was a lot of questions about the decisions being made to fund certain projects. And I see that ha starting to happen here. Yeah. I think, um, I think at the highest, thank you for that question. Um, this is, this is the biggest issue I think confronting. There's, there's dimensions of it, but where resources are deployed. Um, it, the shorthand for where Detroit is, and it's only exacerbated itself, if you were there three years ago, it's only exacerbated the, t the notion of the tale of two cities. So uh, the downtown core, uh, Detroit is, just, just imagine a wide rectangle for now, for sake of argument, what the city looks like. There's a, one particular road that cuts through it. It's also the spine of the region uh, called Woodward Avenue. 
And in the city's downtown core and up through its midtown areas, you have the downtown center of Detroit. You have many cultural institutions. Uh, you also have the area where a lot of investment, state, federal, philanthropic, uh, private, corporate dollars have really come, come back to, to almost create a market rate environment in the city of Detroit where market rate has not really been present uh, for a long time. And so we've lived in a non-market rate environment compared to other cities for quite some time. Uh, and I think people are feeling those tensions. And so you have, uh, in some instances, uh, it's happened. Uh, you have some affordable housing units, senior housing have turned market rate in recent years. Where do those people go? Uh, there's, a, there's a racial dimension to this. There's an educational dimension to this. These things are uh, ever present, I think, in our lives in Detroit um, as to the, and perception might as well be reality here because perception is what people feel, right? Um, and if you feel you are not welcome, if you're a person of color and you're, and you're the majority population city and you're seeing downtown look a lot different than what it used to look like and more, more uh, um, luxurious restaurants or things that frankly I can't afford um, and I do okay, you know, you're not, there's a, there's a disconnect. Um, and there's a lot of challenges and a lot of need in the neighborhood and that's where the bulk of the city's population lives. And so for us, I would have to say as we think about it, what we did with this initiative, Kip D, and why it's really important to us is not because like, we're supporting cool projects. It is because we needed to show a test that there is really important work that can happen in neighborhoods that we can set a stage. We viewed this as a pilot, a set a stage for more neighborhood level investments. Doesn't mean we might turn away from our own investments in the quarter. I, I manage arts portfolio. Many arts organizations are on Woodward Avenue. That's not gonna change. But what does it mean to um, turn our attention and our resources more greatly to neighborhoods. We just had this conversation with our board of directors in September. There is no language on our website to talk about it, but this is our focus for the next three years. It is a move from the core, a uh, move from Woodward Avenue, pushing resources out into neighborhoods for Detroit residents. If we don't do that, I mean, th there's all the dimensions of what's happening in cities across the country. I think there's, there could be fear on one side of it that we could have a Ferguson or Baltimore related issue. That's real. Um, there's the fear that, that the neighborhoods could slip back into or slip even further uh, if investment is not being widely uh, spread. There's economic uh, issues, job issues. Um, Detroit will not survive unless we think about the neighborhoods. It's great things are happening in downtown. There's more jobs, more people coming in. I think it's been a lot of good work, but the neighborhoods are like, I can't think of anybody who does not talk about neighborhoods in Detroit. And I. We, we're, we're thinking very hard about it. I feel this initiative sets a stage for us to do more uh, deep work in neighborhoods, and our trustees are bought into that. And I'll just, can I add real quick, just because, I mean, you're, you're doing what you're saying, which is important, but of course, it's his organization, so it's better to come from somebody else. And I, I would just echo that, not just Kresge, who it clearly had a much stronger presence in the neighborhood, doing great work in the neighborhoods. This is across the board. Night, night is starting to understand that. I mean, they have been understanding that recently. And uh, any, I mean, any ideas is, is you guys are a supporter of that as well, is remarkable um, in terms of their diversity, um, geographic diversity, uh, gender, race, diversity, all these sorts of things are, that are are a necessary conversation because, as you know, because you were there, it, it, there was a lot of investment in the Woodward Corridor, and, and quite frankly, it was pretty necessary because the Woodward Corridor wasn't what it is today. Um, and I, so I think hopefully we'll see those successes spread out more equitably now throughout those neighborhoods. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for your time. They'll be around all day so you can ask them additional questions if you didn't get to ask yours. Thank you.